Hi everyone, happy Monday. Here we are with chapter 51, Inside the Cave. Some hours later, Daisy woke up, but at first she didn't open her eyes. She couldn't remember being this cosy since childhood when she'd slept beneath a patchwork quilt stitched by her mother and woken every winter morning to the sound of a fire crackling in her grate. She could hear the fire crackling now and smell venison pies heating in the oven, so she knew she must be dreaming that she was back at home with both her parents. But the sound of flames and the smell of pie were so real that it occurred to Daisy that instead of dreaming she might be in heaven. Perhaps she'd frozen to death on the edge of the marsh. Without moving her body, she opened her eyes and saw a flickering fire and the rough-hewn walls of what seemed to be a very large cavern. And she realised she and her three companions were lying in a large nest of what seemed to be unspun sheep sheep's wool. There was a gigantic rock beside the fire which was covered with long greenish brown marsh weed. Daisy gazed at this rock until her eyes became accustomed to the semi-darkness. Only then did she realise that the rock, which was as tall as two horses, was looking back at her. Even though the old stories said the Ichabog looked like a dragon or a serpent or a drifting ghoul, Daisy knew at once that this was the real thing. In panic, she closed her eyes again, reached out a hand through the soft mass of sheep's wool and found found one of the other's backs and poked it. What? whispered Bert. Have you seen it? whispered Daisy, eyes still tight shut, tightly shut. Yes, said breathed Bert. Don't look at it. I'm not, said Daisy. I told you there was an Ichabog, came Martha's terrified whisper. whisper. I think it's cooking pies, whispered Roderick. All four lay quite still with their eyes closed until the smell of venison pie became so deliciously overpowering that each of them felt it would be almost worth dying to jump up and snatch a pie and maybe wolf down a few mouthfuls before the Ichabod could kill them. Then they heard the monster moving. Its long, coarse hair rustled and its heavy feet made loud, muffling th muffled thumps. There was a clunk as though the monster had laid down something heavy. Then a low, booming voice said, Eat them! All four opened their eyes. You might think the fact that the Ichabod could speak their language would be a huge shock, but they were already so stunned that the monster was real, that it knew how to make fires and that it was cooking venison pies, that they barely stopped to consider that point. The Ichabod had placed a rough-hewn rough wooden platter of pies beside them on the floor, and they realised it must have taken them from the frozen stock of food on the abandoned wagon. Slowly and cautiously, the four friends moved into sitting positions, staring up at the large, mournful eyes of the Ichabog, which peered at them through the tangle of long, coarse, greenish hair that covered it from head to foot. Roughly shaped like a person, it had a truly enormous belly and huge, shaggy paws, each, with, each of which had a single, sharp claw. What do you want with us? asked Bert bravely. In its deep, Booming voice, the Ichabog replied, I'm going to eat you, but not yet. The Ichabog turned, picked up a pair of baskets, which were woven from strips of bark, and walked away to the mouth of the cave. Then, as though a sudden thought had struck it, the Ichabog turned back at them and said, Roar. It didn't actually roar. It simply said the word. The four teenagers stared at the Ichabog, which blinked and then turned around and walked out of the cave a basket in each paw. Then a boulder as large as the cave mouth rumbled its way across the entrance to keep the prisoners inside. They listened as the Ichabog footsteps crunched through the snow outside and died away. Chapter 52. Mushrooms. Never would Daisy and Martha forget the taste of those Baronstown's pies after the long years of cabbage soup at Margrunter's. Indeed, Martha burst into tears at the first bite and said she'd never fo known food could be like this. All of them forgot about the Ichabog while eating. Once they'd finished the pies, they felt braver, and they got up to explore the Ichabog's cave by the light of the fire. Look, said Daisy, who'd found drawings on the wall. A hundred shaggy Ichabogs were being chased by stickmen with spears. See this one, said Roderick, pointing at a drawing close to the mouth of the cave. By the light of the Ichabog's fire, the foursome examined a picture of a lone Ichabog standing face to face with a stick figure, wearing a plumed helmet and holding a sword. That looks like the king, whispered Daisy, pointing at the figure. You don't think he really saw the Ichabog that night, do you? The others couldn't answer. Of course, but I can. 
I'll tell you the whole truth now and I hope you won't be annoyed that I didn't before. Fred really did catch a glimpse of the Ichabog in the thick marsh mist that, that fateful night when Major Beamish was shot. I can also tell you that the following morning the old shepherd who thought his dog had been eaten by the Ichabog heard a whining and scratching at the door and realised that faithful Patch had come home again because of course Spittleworth had set the dog free from the brambles in which he was trapped. Before you judge, the old shepherd too harshly for not letting the king know that Patch hadn't been eaten by the Ichabog after all. You should remember that he was very, he was weary after his long journey to Shoeville. In any case, the king wouldn't have cared. Once Fred had seen the monster, through the mist, nothing and nobody would have persuaded him it wasn't real. I wonder, said Martha, why the Ichabog didn't eat the king. Maybe he really did fight it off like the stories say, asked Roderick doubtfully. You know, it's strange, said Daisy, turning to look at the Ichabog's cave, there, that there aren't any bones in here if the Ichabog eats people. They must eat the bones too, said Bert. His voice was shaking. Now Daisy remembered that, of course, they must have been wrong in thinking that Major Beamish had died in the accident on the marsh. Clearly the Ichabog had killed him, after all. She just reached for Bert's hand to show him how horrible it was for him to be in the lair of his father's killer, when they again heard heavy footsteps outside. Sorry, when they heard heavy footsteps outside again, and knew the monster had returned, all four dashed back to the soft pile of sheep's wool and sat down in it as though they'd never moved. There was a loud rumble as the Ichabog rolled back the stone, letting in the wintry chill. It was still snowing hard outside and the Ichabog had a lot of snow trapped in its hair. In one of its baskets, it had a large number of mushrooms and some firewood. In the other, it had some frozen Shoeville pastries. While the teenagers watched, the Ichabog built up the fire again and placed the icy block of pastries on a flat stone beside it, where they slowly began to thaw. Then, while Daisy, Bert, Merth Martha and Roderick watched, the Ichabog began eating mushrooms. It had a curious way of doing so. It speared a few of them at a time on a single spike protruding from each paw, then picked them off delicately in its mouth, one by one, chewing them up with what looked like great enjoyment. After a while, it seemed to become aware that the four humans were watching it. Raw, it said again, and fell back to ignoring them until it had eaten all of the mushrooms. After which, it carefully lifted the unfrozen shoevilles off the warm rock and offered them to the humans in its huge, hairy paws. It's trying to fatten us up, said Martha in a terrified whisper. But nevertheless, she seized a folder or fancy, and the next second her eyes were closed in ecstasy. After the Ichabog and the humans had eaten, the Ichabog put its two baskets away tidily in the corner, poked up the fire and moved to the mouth of the cave, where the snow continued to fall and the sun was beginning to set. With a strange noise you'd recognise if you've ever heard a bagpipe inflate before somebody starts to play it. The Ichabog drew in breath and began to sing in a language none of the humans could understand. The song echoed forth over the marsh as darkness fell. The four teenagers listened and soon felt drowsy, and one by one they sank back into the nest of sheep's wool and fell asleep. Chapter 53 The Mysterious Monster It was several days before Daisy, Bert, Martha and Roderick plucked up the courage to do anything other than eat the frozen food that the Ichabog brought them from the wagon and watch the monster eat the mushrooms it foraged for itself. Whenever the Ichabog went out, always rolling the enormous boulder into the mouth of the cave to stop them escaping, they discussed it strange ways, but in low voices, in case it was lurking on the other side of the boulder listening. One thing they argued about was whether the Ichabog was a boy or a girl. Daisy, Bert and Roderick all thought it must be male because of the booming depth of its voice. But Martha, who looked after sheep before her family had starved to death, thought the Ichabog was a girl. Its belly's growing, she told them. I think it's going to have babies. The other children discussed, of course. The other... Thing the children discussed, of course, was exactly when the Ichabog was likely to eat them and whether they were going to be able to fight it off when it tried. I think we've a bit of time yet, said Bertha, looking at Daisy and Martha, who were still very skinny from their time at the orphanage. You two wouldn't make much of a meal. If I got it round the back of the neck, said Roderick, miming the action, and Bert hit it really hard in the stomach, we'll never be able to overpower the Ichabog, said a Daisy. It can move a boulder as big as itself. We're no nowhere near strong enough. If only we had a weapon, said Bert, standing up and kicking stones across the cave. Don't you think it's odd, 
said Daisy, that all we've seen the Ichabog eat is mushrooms. Don't you feel as though it's pretending to be fiercer than it really is? It eats sheep, said Martha. Where did all this wool come from if it hasn't eaten sheep? Maybe it just saves up wisps of wool caught on brambles, suggested Daisy, picking up a bit of the soft white pluff. I still don't understand why there aren't any bodies in here if it has, if it's in the habit of eating creatures. What about that song it sings every night, said Bert. It gives me the creeps. If you ask me, it's a battle song. It scares me too, agreed Martha. I wonder what it means, said Daisy. A few minutes later, the giant boulder at the mouth of the cave shifted again and the Ichabog reappeared with its two baskets, one full of mushrooms as usual and the other packed with frozen Kurzberg cheeses. Everyone ate without talking, as they always did, and after the Ichabog had tidied away its baskets and poked up the fire, it moved as the sun was setting to the mouth of the cave, ready to sing its, its strange song in the language the humans couldn't understand. Daisy stood up. Where are you going? whispered Bert, grabbing her ankle. Sit down. No, said Daisy, pulling herself free. I want to talk to it. So she walked boldly to the mouth of the cave and sat down beside the Ichabog. Chapter 54 the Song of the Ichabog. The Ichabog had just drawn breath with its usual sound of an inflating bagpipe when Daisy sat when Daisy said, What language do you sing in Ichabog? The Ichabog looked down at her, startled to find Daisy so close. At first Daisy thought it wasn't going to answer, but at last it said in its slow, deep voice, Icarish. And what's the song about? It's the story of the Ichabogs, and of your kind too. You mean people? asked Daisy. People, yes, said the Ichabog. The two stories are one story, because people were bonded out of Ichabogs. It drew its breath to sing, but Daisy asked, what does bonded mean? Is it the same as born? No, said the Ichabog, looking down at her. Bonded is very different from being born. It's how new Ichabogs come to be. Daisy wanted to be polite, seeing how enormous the Ichabog was, so she said cautiously, That does sound a bit like being born. Well, it isn't, said the Ichabog in its deep voice. Born and bonded are very different things. When babies are bonded, we who have bonded them die. Always, asked Daisy, noticing how the Ichabog absentmindedly rubbed its tummy as it spoke. Always, said the Ichabog. That is the way of the Ichabog. To live with your children is one of the strangenesses of people. But that's so sad, said Daisy slowly, to die when your children are born. It isn't sad at all, said the Ichabog. The bonding is a glorious thing. Our whole lives lead up to the bonding. What we're doing and what we're feeling when our babies are bonded gives them their natures. It is very important to have a good bonding. I don't understand, said Daisy. If I die sad and hopeless, explained the Ichabog, my babies won't survive. I've watched my fellow Ichabogs die in despair, one by one, and their babies survive them only by seconds. An Ichabog can't live without hope. I'm the last Ichabog left, and my bonding will be the most important bonding in history, because if my bonding goes well, our species will survive. And if not, Ichabogs will be gone forever. All our troubles began from a bad bonding, you know. Is that what your song's about, asked Daisy? The bad bonding? The Ichabog nodded its, nodded, its eyes fixed on the darkening snowy marsh. Then it took another deep bagpipe breath and began to sing. And this time it sang the words so the human could understand. At the dawn of time when only Ichabogs existed stony, man was not created with his cold, flint-hearted ways. Then the world in its perfection was like heaven's bright reflection. No one hunted us or harmed us in those lost beloved days. Oh, Ichabogs, come bonding back, come bonding back, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, come bonding back, come bonding back, my own. 
Then tragedy, one stormy night, came bitterness, wandered out of fright, and bitterness, so tall and stout, was different from its fellows. Its voice was rough, its ways were mean, then the likes of it had not been seen before, and so they drove it out with angry blows and bellows. A wicker box, be born, did wise, be born, did wise, my wicker box. A wicker box, be warned, did wise, be warned, did wise, my own. A thousand miles from its old home, its bonding time arrived. Alone in darkness, bitterness expired, and hatred came to being. A hairless wicker bog, this last, a beast sworn to avenge the past. With blood lost was the creature fired, its evil eye foreseeing. A wicker box, be born, did kind, be born, did kind, my wicker box. A wicker box, be born, did kind, be born, did kind, my own. Then hatred spawned the race of man, twas from ourselves that man began. From bitterness and hate they swelled, to armies raised to smite us. In hundreds Ichabogs were slain, our blood, blood poured on the land like rain. Our ancestors like trees were felled, and still men came to fight us. Our Ichabogs be born did brave, be born did brave, my Ichabogs. Our Ichabogs be born did brave, be born did brave, my own. Men forced us from our sunlit home, away from grass to mud and stone. In the endless fog and rain, and here we stayed and dwindled, till of our race there's only one, survivor of the spear and gun, whose children must begin again, with hate and fury kindled. A wicker box, now kill the men, now kill the men, my wicker box. A wicker box, now kill the men, now kill the men, my own. Daisy and Mipper Ichabog sat in silence for a while after the Ichabog had finished singing. The stars were coming out now. Daisy fixed her eyes on the moon and said, How many people have you eaten, Ichabog? The Ichabog sighed. None so far. Ichabog's like mushrooms. Are you planning on eating us when your bonding time comes? So that Daisy asked, so your babies are born believing Ichabogs eat people. You want to turn them into people killers, don't you, to take back your land? The Ichabog looked down at her. It didn't seem to want to answer, but at last it nodded its huge shaggy head. Behind Daisy and the Ichabog, Bert, Martha and Roderick exchanged terrified glances by the light of the dying fire. I know what it's like to lose the people you love the most, said Daisy. My mother died and my father disappeared. For a long time after my father went away, I made myself believe that he was still alive because I had to think, had to, or I think I'd have died as well. Daisy got to her feet and looked into the Ichabog's sad eyes. I think people need hope nearly as much as Ichabog's do. But, she said, placing her hand over her heart, my mother and father are still are both still in here, and they always will be. So when you eat me, Ichabog, eat my heart last. I'd like to keep my parents as alive as long as I can. She walked back into the cave, and the four humans settled down on their piles of wool again beside the fire. A little later, sleepy though she was, Daisy thought she heard the Ichabog sniff. Right, that's as much as we're doing today. We've had four chapters just to get us going for the week. Uh, today, there's an activity on Purple Mash for you like normal, so head over there and have a go.